going to try and do justice as best I can to the purpose of this meeting, which is to honor Lavoie Finnegan. Uh, in doing that, though, I also want to make sure I do justice as best I can to the process that, as an attorney, I've gone through uh, helping out both the Bundy family and the Finnegan family and to help you understand what that process has been like. So the first thing I always do with this presentation, if I give it, is welcome all the government informants. Uh, and, well, you know, it, I, I have, it sounds a little silly, but, but to, you have to have been there to understand how there really were government informants everywhere. In fact, in the, I don't know how many of you came down to Nevada, but there was a government informant that was literally given a seat by the marshals in the courtroom every day. And that same government informant took their phone, went down into the cafeteria and took pictures of jurors and published them online. Which, you know, of course, if we had done, we would have gotten in a lot of trouble. We informed the marshals that this informant had done that. They found this informant on their list and basically gave the informant a pass and continued to let the informant come into the courtroom and sit by the marshals throughout the trial, even though this person had published photos of jurors, which is really a no-no. So, welcome all government informants. Um, uh, good luck in all you do. So, um, I'll, I'll try and pay tribute as best I can to one of and I think that's already been done. I, I need to rush through some of this, but I can't talk about LaVoy without paying a little homage to one of his favorite people, which was Ezra Tapp Benson, and you've heard this quote today already. Uh, but, but at the source of, at the heart of who LaVoy was, if I understand him at all, was a deep and abiding love of individual personal liberty. And as a result of that, he loved Ezra Tapp Benson, who of course said the fight for freedom is God's fight. When a man stands for freedom, he stands for God. As long as he stands for freedom, he stands with God. And were he to stand alone, he would still stand with God. And any man will be eternally vindicated and rewarded for his stand for freedom. Now interestingly, there are many in the world who do not believe in God anymore. Uh, but I would take you back to the definition of what religion is. How many of you know the what religion means? Uh, religion has become a term associated with godly belief. And, and that's probably appropriate. It in fact means a duty to the gods. So it's not a fundamentally Christian concept. It actually comes out of, uh, I think, Rome. And it tried to define for people the duty they felt to their gods. Right? Not a Christian God per se. So really, everybody's religious. They just have different gods they serve, right? Some of us don't believe we serve gods at all, but fundamentally you do believe, each and every one of us, that we have a duty to something. And I appreciate it as Debbie talked about uh, climate change, that uh, to conquer our problems in this world, requires not just understanding the core concept of the problem, but understanding the way other people who disagree with us think, so that we can try and help each other come to an understanding of what is best and true, right? If we don't do that, if we don't go out and understand the way other people think, how can we come to any sort of edification and understanding? Does that make sense? So religion uh, is ever-present, in my opinion, with everybody. You just have to take some time to try and understand what their religion is. Because they all have it. And they all have faith, believe it or not. Anyway, I'll save that conversation for another day. Alright. On January 23rd, 2016, uh, you know this time frame, Lavoie Finnecum leaves the Harney County Resource Center to travel 11 hours to Cedar City, Utah to do a radio interview with a guy named Brian Hyde. And Lavoie says in that radio interview, I felt pulled to be here, uh, that I needed to make this trip down here. And one of the other comments he makes is this thing, speaking of his time at the refuge, can never stop till the Hammonds get out of prison. 
So there's Lavoie's commitment. Lavoie's commitment in going to the refuge is to make sure that the Hammonds get out of prison. He then says, when it comes to principles, you must be willing to stand on the principle because it is right. You don't stand on it because you might be popular or it might be advantageous. You stand on the principle because it's true. And you let the consequences take care of themselves. You let the chips fall where they may. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're not all in. He also goes on to say the following, and I won't read the whole thing to you, but basically he explains why he's there. And he puts a challenge out to ranchers and other food producers and producers from the land to basically stand up. And he says to them, if you will do that, we will come and help you. Now, one of the things that he implores people to understand, uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm ready to go to that next one yet. I, I think I'll explain. Another, he implores people to try and get them to understand that if they do not see this through, that it will in fact be worse for those who they have come to help than it was before. Which is one of the reasons Lavoie is expressing his commitment to see it through to the end, because if not, you've stepped up to help some people that you're going to leave in a worse situation than if you hadn't come at all. And a caller calls in then, and perhaps in a very prophetic way says, they are not going to let you win. They cannot afford to let you win. Because if you win, it will happen in other places. And Lavoie then says, but we are not going to lose. Now, this is again uh, an expression from the promise that he makes that if you will step up, cancel your contracts with the government, we will come and we will be there for you. And if you were to try and pinpoint what it is Lavoie committed to do, what he, had he, what he had committed to accomplish, this was the heart of it. He wanted people to know that if you were having troubles as a producer of the land, an owner of the land, he recognized that you were unable alone to sustain your ability to be free on that land. And they wanted to have a coalition of people that could go from place to place and stand on behalf of people who were willing to cancel those contracts with the BLM. So there had to be a commitment, and this is what he's expressing, that if you will do this, we will come and we will stand with you. Now, interestingly, he says the sandy soil of the middle ground is being quickly washed away. And you're going to find that you're going to have to stand on one side or the other side. If you will make that commitment, I will give all I have to support you. Again, expressions of how much Lavoie is willing to give if people will start to build this coalition of both ranchers, farmers, uh, producers, and others who want to step in and support them of what he's willing to give. Uh, he goes on to say, for me to come to a point where I'm willing to risk everything, which I have done. This is not about cows, grass. The interviewer steps in and says it's not about the Bundys, and he says no, it's about every citizen. We are at the cusp of losing our freedom forever. I will live my remaining days freely, and I will do everything I can, anything, give everything I have to preserve this for my children, my neighbors. We are in this, we are all in, all the chips are on the table. Now Lavoie has been demonized to a great degree by those who don't understand the type of man he was. Because he's seen by those who antagonize his motives and his actions as somebody who was an extremist. But for those of us who have taken the time to get to know his family, to get to know Lavoie, to get to know his friends, you know that he would have done this for anyone. No matter what color, no matter what persuasion, no matter what religion, Lavoie would have stood for anyone for the things that he believed. Individual freedom, right? If you had said, Lavoie, my individual freedom is in jeopardy, Lavoie would stand with you. Uh, Lavoie would immediately return on January 24, 2016 to Burns, Oregon, where he would be murdered one day shy 
of his 55th birthday as the culminating act of a criminal conspiracy that was commenced in Nevada and that was ultimately led by the state of Oregon, the United States of America, the FBI, the BLM, and other cooperating agencies of federal, state, and local governments. Now, that may sound a little harsh, but have you ever studied RICO laws? You ever studied patterns of unlawful activity? When you start to look at these laws which the government uses to prosecute people and you apply them to what the government did starting in Nevada, and you're honest about your perspective, right? You're not tainted by your political view. You're not tainted by what you want to have happen to somebody, but you honestly, legally look at what the government started to do in Nevada and prior to that in Utah, and you follow it all the way through to Malheur, it matches criminal conspiracy. It matches the behavior that they prosecuted the members of the mob for. And it culminates in the death of a man. And the imprisonment of several others. To get there, I want to go back, though. I want to go back all the way here to the late 1850s. When the Bundy family settles near Bunkerville, and we're going to jump around in time, and I'm not going to have time to tell you all this today, so I'm going to go as far as I can, and then we're just going to stop, and uh, maybe someday you'll get to hear the rest. If you're unlucky, or lucky, depending on how you see this today. The Bundy family settles near Bunk Bunkerville back in the 1850s. Now that's before Nevada even becomes a state, which doesn't happen until 1864. Now, this is an important thing to understand, because if you want to understand the conflict that begins to arise amongst ranchers and landowners in the West, you have to understand the changes implemented with federal land policy and federal land management. And the biggest change, although I'm not saying it's the, the most prominent change, but one of the biggest change occurs in the Federal Land Policy Management Act of 1976. And at that time, uh, the law, the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, called for regulations and plans for the protection of public land areas of critical environmental concern, or sorry, that called that a, a regulation plan for the protection be developed surrounding these areas of critical environmental concern. <clears throat> now, what is an area of critical environmental concern? Well, that means an area within the public lands where special management attention is required, uh, to protect and prevent irreparable damage to important historic, cultural, or scenic values, fish and wildlife resources, or other natural systems or processes, or to protect life and safety from natural hazards. Sounds almost common sense, right? Uh, it's the devil's in the details, right? What, what you do with this is what, what matters. The act also called for a requirement for prompt development of regulations for the protection of areas of critical environmental concern, as also mentioned, and it also calls for the employment or the deployment of funds to do this. Now, if any of you have heard Cal uh, Cliven Bundy, Calvin, Calvin Klein, Cliven Bundy, same thing. <laughs> if any of you have heard Cliven Bundy speak, uh, you will, and, and you've heard him talk about his experience with the BLM prior to about 1998, he will be the first to tell you that they didn't have guns at that time. <laughs> so, when people weren't doing what they wanted, what was their redress? We, we've heard that term, redress, right? How did the BLM redress their grievances prior to 1998? You had to go to court. Um, after 1998 and into the late 2000s, what was different? They had guns. And they had standing armies, essentially, within, or law enforcement companies within these federal agencies. And so now, BLM could take more direct action through permissions that were set in place through offices like the Office of Law Enforcement Services. And they could draw on the police powers of the executive branch to begin enforcing things like any problems with these areas of critical environmental concern. Now, uh, in 1993, Cliven cancels his grazing permits. He attempts to pay Clark County for grazing fees. Now, if you are a rational person, you might find yourself disagreeing with his actions. 
If you were a rational person, you might find yourself agreeing with his actions. Because two different sides could take what he has done here and go to court and argue multiple perspectives on whether or not that was okay. What's the problem with that for a guy like Clyde Bundy? The money that it takes to fight the government when they're on the other side of what you should be doing with your land. So Cliven, uh, again, I'm assigning some motive here, but I'm, if I'm looking at this from the perspective of a lawyer who's engaged in cases which cost significant amounts of money, I can see why a person would have a motivation to want to deal with their county government over the federal government. Just simple cost. And also the ability to communicate. Now, some people have called this irrational. Great. But it means you're not looking clearly from the perspective of Clive and Bundy and other ranchers who have faced this problem, the difficulty that you have in financing and communicating. Uh, in 1998, the Las Vegas field office, BLM, finalized their resource management plan for the district, district, and the plan designated several areas of critical environmental concern. The Gold Butte Complex has seven areas of critical environmental concern and includes all of the categories targeted for protection within FLIPMA. Now, whose ranch is near Gold Butte? Live and Bundy's. And at, what is the federal government probably not comprehending, maybe they are locally at this time, is about to happen with Clive and Bundy. He's about to have a problem with the way you're going to start regulating his historic use. Perfectly reasonable thing to, to contemplate is going to happen. They go out in 1998, they get a district court order, and they seek to basically uh, permanently enjoin Clive and Bundy from grazing his livestock within the Bunkerville allotment. Now, how long have the Bundys been here? How long has the state been a state? Less time than that. And now you're going to go in and tell a, a family who has been operating longer than the state has been a state that they're going to change the way they behave or else. Clearly, whoever did that does not understand people who live in the West or Western cultures. Now, if you demonize that culture now, all of a sudden you're okay. Why? Because these people are stupid, these people are bad, these people don't get it. And that's what started to happen. Clive and Bundy began to be demonized. Because he was easy to demonize from the perspective of people who lived in cities or suburban areas. But when you sit down and talk with Clive and Bundy and actually try to understand him, and you understand the history of this area, it's easy to see why this is problematic. Now, in about 2006, and the reason I plug this in is it's connected, and it's previous in time to what starts to occur both in Bunkerville and in Oregon. And this is a great article um, that's been written up by the Los Angeles Times about a, a very tragic incident in southern Utah. And it was titled A Sting in the Desert, and it covered an operation called Operation Cerberus where the BLM went into southern Utah into a small town, targeted a couple families for artifact uh, raiding and uh, illegal artifact trading. Now, it just turns out that, it, have any of you actually been to southeastern Utah? Yes. Have you ever been to, like, Grand Gulch or Mesa Verde? Um, this area is filled with artifacts. And in fact, if you talk to any local who has been anywhere outside of Landing, Monticello, Utah, which is in this area, they will tell you that you it used to be that you could hardly walk anywhere without kicking up some sort of ceramic shard or uh, an arrow. And so the people who have lived in this area have picked up and collected artifacts for decades, if not over a hundred, uh, who ended up taking his life and uh, destroyed uh, essentially a man's life because he had engaged in this artifact collection. They turned uh, individuals of the community against
against him, turned a local substance abuser into an informant who also took his own life, and began to prosecute Dr. Red for engaging in artifact dealing, illegal artifact dealing. And it was called Operation Severus. Now in 2008, just two years later, this woman was appointed to come into Southern Nevada and to head up the BLM. And if you look at the date, it, it corresponds with the election of a new president and uh, the appointment of some new individuals into certain departments within the Department of Interior. Uh, Ms. Rugwell took over and she got from the government a report that they had not been properly managing these areas of critical environmental concern. Basically, you haven't been doing your job down there in Southern Nevada. And her job was to come in and get things in order and to start doing the job right. And guess where one of the problem areas in Southern Nevada was? Live and Bundy. And <coughs> Ms. Rugwell tried to address that. She tried to come up with a plan that would deal with this, and by 2012, she had been assigned uh, a person from the Office of Law Enforcement Services named Dan Love. And Dan Love was brought in to uh, help her engage in an impoundment action uh, against Clive and Bundy to help uh, her do her job right, because the uh, accusation coming down from the federal government to the Southern District of Nevada was you hadn't been doing your job right, get your act together. And her job was to do that. So she comes in, and she actually became a witness in Nevada uh, for the Bundy trials in for the Bundy trial in Nevada. Well, uh, going along with this, remember Operation Cerberus is going on in Southern Utah, uh, 2009. Uh, it's still going on. And guess who the special agent in charge of Operation Cerberus is? Dan Love. Well, what most people don't know is that there was also an agent assigned from the FBI who was involved in Operation Cerberus. And he was a friend of Mr. Love. And you know what his name was? Greg Bretzing. That's right. So Greg Bretzing and Dan Love were both working on Operation Cerberus together. Shortly after Operation Cerberus, Greg Bretzing would be transferred. Uh, I think he would be promoted. And then by 2014, uh, as you'll see, he would be somewhere else. 2009, Operation Cerberus has 26 defendants, three suicides, and one promotion. Love was named BLM Agent of the Year and promoted to Special Agent in Charge of Utah and Nevada because of his work on Operation Cerberus. Um, in 2011, remember Ms. Rugwell? She's working in Nevada, in the Southern District of Nevada. She sends a letter in 2011 to Clive and Bundy which says, remove all unauthorized livestock from public lands described above within 15 days of receipt of this notice. Now, for those of you who have followed this for any amount of time at all know what Clive and Bundy's reaction to that is going to be. It was overwhelmingly positive, and he said, okay. And uh, that didn't happen. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> that would be a little bit ironic. Uh, apparently not. Um, I'll, you guys might be a little bit too literal here, or I'm really not funny. It's probably the second. So, yeah, too soon. Uh, by 2012, Ms. Rugwell becomes the Southern Nevada District Manager of the BLM. Uh, 2013, it is decided that they're going to need a new U.S. District Court order to deal with Cliven because the court, uh, it, there's some conversation going on with the administration that says, hey, this 1998 order is probably not good. You probably better go get a new one. And so, um, in conjunction with a desire to impound his cattle, uh, Ms. Rugwell, uh, and the southern office of the BLM in Nevada goes and gets a new order. And in the new order, it says, uh, sorry, I'm actually looking at the, uh, I think I'm looking at the indictment now. Uh, so let's not go to that one yet. Uh, they get the new order in 2013, and believe it or not, they attempted to do an impoundment uh, prior to 2014. 2012, and uh, Ms. Rugwell is told 
that she's going to allow Dan Love to oversee the law enforcement uh, parts of the impoundment. And she, te she will testify later uh, in the trials in Nevada that she did not agree with the methods of Dan Love. And shortly thereafter, she is transferred out. But guess who stays for the next impoundment? Dan Love. And in 2014, uh, they come back at Cliven, and they say in their, uh, in their indictment that in connection with legal proceedings, Bundy threatened to interfere. So they're already beginning to lay the groundwork in 2012 with Clive and Bundy's willingness to interfere. They take it even farther, though. Uh, they say that the defendants, and this would be in this case, uh, in the trial, it would be Cliven, Ryan, Ammon, and Ryan Payne. The defendants caused images of Davy Bundy's arrest to be broadcasted over the internet, combining them with false, deceitful, and deceptive statements to the effect that the BLM supposedly employed snipers against Bundy. Family, Bundy family members used excessive force during the arrest and arrested Bundy for exercising his First Amendment rights. Now, standoff is occurring. Um, I remember posting this on my website. And recognize that guy right there? Um, and I remember, I, I wrote, I'm surprised this picture, along with a few others floating around out there, have not gone more viral. Are you aware of this photo? This is April 15, 2014. I'm posting this on my Facebook page. Something just happened in America, and the consequences and ramifications that follow will be monumental. Um, little did I realize I'd be, at that time, I'd be directly involved in the uh, trials relative to these men. By, by April 18th, Senator Reid has already, now think about this, this is within six days of the standoff the alleged standoff in Bunkerville, Nevada. There have been no arrests <coughs> by this time. Okay? There's, there's no indication of any arrest. But for some reason, Senator Reid says Clive and Bundy does not recognize the United States. He says that the United States is a foreign government. He doesn't pay his taxes. How does he know that? Is there a court of law that has decided Clive and Bundy doesn't pay his taxes? What is a U.S. senator doing piping off about whether or not somebody pays his taxes? I'll tell you what he was doing. It's not, it's not, it's not rocket science what he was doing right here. He also says he doesn't follow the law. What does he mean he doesn't follow the law? Was there a court that determined Clive and Bundy hadn't followed the law yet? And in fact, the two subsequent courts that addressed that said what? <clears throat> Not guilty. So why is a senator of the United States of America getting up on his soapbox to attack a citizen of the United States without due process? Well, what, what Senator Reid is doing is he's laying out all the factors necessary to identify Cliven Bundy as a domestic terrorist. How does Senator Harry Reid know that he should be laying out talking points to categorize these people as domestic terrorists within four days of the incident? I, I don't know. But it is perplexing to me that a U.S. Senator, well, maybe it shouldn't be, for, maybe I'm too naive, right? Since when does a U.S. Senator use his soapbox to do stupid things? Um, and he says that by, this again, this is by April 18th, that he has spoken with Attorney General Eric Holder, FBI leaders, and the Clark County Sheriff, and said he understands, this is within four days, that there was a task force being set up to deal with Bundy. Now he's lying. We know he's lying from the discovery that will come out this task force has been already set up prior to this date and is actually being used to entrap Clive and Bundy. The government has conspired to entrap Clive and Bundy. All you have to do if you want to know the truth of this is actually 
take five seconds and go look at the discovery in the cases if you can get to it, because guess what it's still under? Seal. So everything I'm showing you today, guess what, it's already publicly available. Because if I were to show you what's inside the record, which any report, any reporters here, you can go grab and request this stuff. You can have it for yourself. And you can see that they were both lying and entrapping and conspiring to throw him under the bus from the get-go. And this guy knows about it by April 18th. And he lies, saying we're about to set one up. It's not true. They'd already set it up. Now, did they set up another task force to make sure he would go to jail? Probably. But they had already set up a task force to make sure he did go to jail by this point in time. I think my time's up, actually. Yeah, it's Bible Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Carol's going like this. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. He's lying. He's lying. I'm pretty sure that's domestic terrorism. All right. So... Senator Reid literally lays out the talking points for domestic terrorism by April 18th. It almost makes you think there was a plan in the works, and in fact there was. Now this is the code relative to domestic terrorism, and these are the talking points that Senator Reid has laid out in his uh, conversations. By September 2014, again, we have another, um, I, I don't, I honestly have no idea I'd be a part of this case, but the LA Times piece was so, affected me so profoundly that I also posted about it relative to the sting that happened in southeastern uh, Utah. Now, um, I don't know why I'm about to skip so far ahead. I think maybe I put one of my slides out of order. Um, but the uh, Hammonds are kind of what happens next, the next catalyst, which is a little bit odd because this isn't happening until January of 2016. And so between uh, March and April of 2014, all the way up until January of 2016, not much is going on. There have been no arrests. Um, thank you. Uh, there's no uh, threat of arrest, but there are some little things happening. Like, for example, at this time, if you're Ammon Bundy and you're trying to travel, guess what starts happening to you? You're getting stopped. Uh, unexplainably, things are um, being asked of you that are not asked of a normal person who's traveling. And it's almost like somebody has labeled you within the law enforcement database as a domestic terrorist. And in fact, that's what they had done. Um, and they had begun to track Hammond and others. Now, uh, in January 2016, the Steve and Dwight Hammond are scheduled to return to a mandatory sentence. And in that sentencing process, uh, the federal district judge said that the sentencing was grossly disproportionate to the crimes and that the five-year sentences were a violation of the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. He said, I am not supposed to use the word fairness in criminal law. I know that if I know that I had a criminal law professor a long time ago yell at me for doing that, and I don't do that, but this, it would be a sentence which would shock the conscience to me. And so, uh, instead of a five-year sentence, he had given Dwight a three-month sentence and Stephen Hammond a one-year sentence. The U.S. prosecutor for the District of Oregon appealed that and demanded, can you imagine, being a person who would look at Stephen Dwight Hammond and being offended by the fact that they were only serving three months in a year. And it so offends your religious duty, because that truly must be what this prosecutor had, right? A religious fervor. A belief so deep in his religion that these sinners who had sinned against his religion had to pay the price. And that's almost what this prosecutor seemed to have, is a religious fervor against them. And you wonder why Christians and Muslims get 
attacked for their religious fervor. You haven't seen religious fervor until you've seen a hellbent prosecutor. Because, boy, this guy had it. And he was out for blood. And he wanted those guys back in jail for that five-year sentence. Um, as a result of that, you all know what happens. January of 2016, Mount Here National Wild, uh, Wildlife Refuge occupation happens. Now, a good friend of mine uh, saw a report in the Oregonian that had kind of posed the question, what if um, the Oregon protesters had been black? And he saw this article in the Oregonian, he said, yeah, what if? And strangely enough, they had referenced a case where, guess what? The only other wildlife refuge occupation that's occurred in the history of the United States was conducted by who? Some black folks. Did you know that? 1979. And <laughs> this is wonderful, right? It's called In Ray Timmons. In 1979, a passionate and civic-minded leader, after failing to get a direct response from the government to his prior petitions for redress, organized a group of like-minded associates into a group called the People Organized for Equal Rights, who occupied and took possession of a federal wildlife refuge. Like the present case, protesters in Timmins entered the wildlife refuge with the apparent intention of asserting claim to the land. Sound familiar? Um, this was written, this write-up came from, and research came from um, my paralegal in both the Bundy case, uh, Bundy Defense in Oregon and Nevada. His name's Rick Kerber. You can actually find this on his site, freecapitalist.com. Uh, please forgive the offensive use of the word capitalist. I know that's a trigger word. There are psychologists outside if you'd like to get some counseling on that. Um, approximately 25 to 40 individuals began possession without permits or authorization and informed the project leader of the Savannah National Wildlife Refuge Complex Department of the Interior that they intended to remain indefinitely. Boy, that sounds... Jason, does that sound familiar to you right now? <clears throat> Um, and said that they did not recognize the area as federal property. Well, I swear I've heard those words come out of Lavoy Finnegan's mouth. The leader of the occupation, having previously tried to address the government, went upon the land to pray that God deliver him. Oh, did you guys know that black people also believed in God? Holy cow, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. I thought only white guys were Christian zealots. Um, but apparently, I guess it's happened before. Jason, you guys are not alone. Can you believe that? Uh, see, it's so offensive how people try to divide, isn't it? Now, that he helped him gain the attention of his government. Sound like the redress of grievances? You crazy people who are out talking about the Constitution and your desire for a redress of grievances. That's just never happened before. You must be extremists who belong to a militia that wants to kill people. It's so absurd that one has to wonder about the intellectual capacity of those who have done any research whatsoever on what's going on here and seek to divide rather than to understand. Now... The occupiers brought several unauthorized off-road vehicles, something like 40 automobiles, and commenced bringing building materials, including concrete blocks, bags of mortar, and ladders. Now, the government, rather than militarizing the situation, did something incredible. They acted like a government who cared about their citizens and who cared about people. They followed well-established and predictable legal precedent by acting first through the courts. The United States government filed a complaint for ejectment. Now that, to the average person, goes, that makes sense. You know, when Ammon Bundy, Ryan Bundy, Cliven, or sorry, um, Lavoy Finnicum and others, Jason Patrick, Eric Parker, anybody who wanted to show up, uh, Ryan Payne, you know what we ought to do with those guys out at Malheur? We should go file a civil ejectment claim. But that makes too much sense, doesn't it? Because how do you justify exorbitant budgets for bearcats and helicopters and militarized weapons and red flag operations if you just simply go get a 
a civil ejectment order, which is what they did in 1979. So they had case precedent for it, and they had authority to do that. Now, surprisingly, four holdouts remained at the Wildlife Refuge in 1979. You cannot make this stuff up. I mean, with just this much effort, those attorneys who wanted so bad to get these guys in jail could have done just a little bit of homework and realized this had happened before. Now, unfortunately, they did not. Um, this is also great. During this occupation, the U.S. attorney, an assistant U.S. attorney, and a U.S. marshal came to the area to meet with the protesters and discuss the order that they had gotten for civil ejectment. They encouraged the protesters to leave the area voluntarily and pursue their claims through normal judicial proceedings. The U.S. attorney spoke personally with the protesters and explained that he had no desire to arrest anyone. Following the visit, uh, the four holdouts failed to vacate. So the federal government issued an order to show cause why they should not be held in criminal contempt for their failure to obey the April 30th order. And of course, just like Ammon, Ryan, and others, they wanted 360 years in jail for this, right? No. They wanted 30 days in jail for the four holdouts. That's what the judge ordered for them being in contempt of not, uh, of not following the civil ejectment order. Now, I know some will say, but these guys had guns. But guess what? It's a Second Amendment right, and they didn't use them. Who did? And under sworn testimony in the Astorita trial, admitted to having fired them irresponsibly, escalating the situation not once, is there any testimony, admission, or piece of evidence that any single person used their gun irresponsibly in the occupation of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge, nor at the Bunkerville standoff, to justify even the shooting that occurred at Ryan Payne as he put his hands out the door, uh, the window door, and was shot at by the Oregon State Police Officer, which came out in the Astorita trial. Again, do your homework, right? Where is the press? Where are the attorneys who are doing their homework on this? Now, there's a man using his gun irresponsibly. <laughs> He's so polite, he won't even go into the buildings to occupy them <laughs> at this point in time. I I'm kind of kidding. Uh, we know Lavoie went into the buildings, but uh, I, I love that picture, so I put it in there. Now, sorry, i, I got to wrap this up. i got to tell you, maybe about one more thing. There's, I I'm honestly not even a quarter of the way through, so I'm not going to finish this with you today, but some other day. Keep going. Um, we show up in June of 2016 in Portland, Oregon, for a defense meeting uh, amongst the defense attorneys for those who prosecuted for the occupation at the Harney County Resource Center. I love, I'm telling you, someday somebody's got to make a Harney County Resource Center hack because I would buy it. I don't know if anybody else would, but I would buy it. Um, and we introduced to them the concept of adverse possession. Now understand there are 26... 29 defendants, I think it's 26, and they could not run away fast enough from us. In fact, I was texting my paralegal <laughs> while I was in this meeting because their reaction was so averse to it. They hated it. And I, as I'm texting him, he sends me this message. He says, anyone who thinks it's a better narrative to argue that these people are simple trespassers still has to explain why change the sign, why block the entrance, why say we are staying for years, why deal with the land records, why take over the offices, why inventory the artifacts, why make roads. That's more, far more than trespass. On the other hand, the law on adverse possession is the language of lawfully ousting a legal owner, just like 1979, similar to the first wildlife re uh, refuge. And then he sends me this picture. No offense to the people in it, but it is it was humorous to me, and I started to laugh a little bit out loud in this defense meeting. He says, who's going to believe these guys are trespassers? <laughs> <laughs> and you guys know Sean there. Kind-hearted man. Um, but, but honestly, how are you going to argue that, right? Simple trespassers. That's clearly not what they were. 
And they ran from us like you wouldn't believe. The, de the defense attorneys did. Um, now, to understand why, this will help you understand also why they ran. There is a real strong desire to plead in federal criminal cases. Because of these statistics, 2014 federal criminal cases filed 85,781, which in and of itself is crazy. Seems like America wants to turn everybody into a criminal these days. Um, and the percent convicted, 91%. So if you get charged with a federal crime, your chances are already about 9%. You're going to either plead, which is a conviction, or you're going to be convicted. Now guess what? Your chances of not being convicted are better if you go to trial. They try to convince you otherwise. Hey, you don't want to take this to trial. You have the book thrown at you. You're going to get all this time. But your chances are better of not being convicted in a jury trial. 77% of defendants standing trial are convicted. Still not good. right? You've got a 33% chance. If you're lucky, you're not going to jail. This was a judge in my own jurisdiction in the state of Utah, former prosecutor. He says, if you take a case to trial where you've done something wrong, you'll lose. That's how it works. 95% of the time, they lose. Maybe 98% of the time, they lose. You know why they lose? Because they're guilty. That's a magistrate judge in Utah. That's his attitude, former prosecutor, uh, U.S. prosecutor from the state of Utah. Now, you'd think that this is just a right-wing extremist problem. Those statistics are not a right-wing extremist problem. They're a problem being faced by all Americans today who have faced an oppressive criminal justice society uh, in the United States of America. Prosecutors. Now, even worse for those who are defense attorneys, when you go up against a prosecutor, look what they get. You think I get this as a defense attorney? I was threatened by the U.S. prosecutor in the state of Nevada with sanctions and a bar complaint if I fought too hard. He didn't like my fighting style. My kung fu wasn't good enough for him. He told me if I didn't stop, he was going to complain. I brought that up in front of the judge. She didn't seem to like the fact that he threatened me with that. And, um, but that's a problem for us as defense attorneys because guess what? We don't get absolute immunity like a prosecutor does. And even in granting that absolute immunity, courts have recognized that this immunity does leave the genuinely wrong defendant without civil redress against a prosecutor whose malicious or dishonest action deprives him of liberty. But the alternative of giving them qualified immunity would deserve the broader public interest. It would prevent the vigorous and fearless performance of the prosecutor's duty that is essential to the proper functioning of the criminal justice system. I thought the proper functioning of the judicial system was to protect those who had been accused, who were presumed innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we So not only do you face those statistics, but you face judges and prosecutors who are religiously devoted to your prosecution and ensuring that you go to jail because they have become religious zealots in their righteous cause. Now, we think that only you right-wing extremists are religious. But man, how do you explain this? This is not science. There is no scientific basis that you can justify this behavior in courts of law amongst judges and prosecutors. It is religion, folks. And it is embraced by everyone. It's just a matter of which God you're serving. Now here, National Wildlife Refuge Occupation. Turns out that we found these wonderful photos. You can't see it here, but if you look real closely, Ammon Bundy is actually giving lectures on adverse possession. Not trespass. Not protest, adverse possession. And we were able to get those in front of the jury in spite of the fact that the judge and the prosecutors tried to prevent us from presenting those. Now, if you understand constitutional law, my client has a right to not incriminate himself in court to get his side of the story out. But that judge in Oregon made us put Ammon on the stand if we wanted our story told and they would allow us to do it in no other way. Now, you would think some liberal reporter out there would understand why that's a problem. Maybe a conservative reporter. Nobody covered the fact that he was deprived of his Fifth Amendment rights, 
forced to testify in order to get his side of the story out in an American court of law. Instead, we want to keep talking about whether or not he's a member of a militia. You've got to be kidding me, right? Come, Something is wrong out there when we're not talking about fundamental principles of American government that protect everybody, like your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. But again, that would take homework. Right? That's not as easy as just telling people what you want them to believe. Ammon taught this adverse possession concept almost everywhere he went, and in almost every photo we found where he was giving a lecture somewhere, guess what? Adverse possession was in there. But Lavoie Finnicum was shot, why? Because he was part of an armed militia takeover of an unprecedented event that had probably never occurred since when? Sagebrush Rebellion, right? Or perhaps the American Revolution. Just not true. It is not true. On the other hand, it, I, I find this to be a nice stark contrast. Here's Hammond Bundy, the militia member, right? The, the dangerous militia leader who's off outside the refuge teaching people in a school auditorium. And here's what they sent to deal with him. That's what your money's going to. This is why uh, FLIPMA has become a problem. When you begin to fund the militarization of National Parks, Forest Service, and the BLM. By the way, National Park Service, does anybody remember they were a part of the combined forces in Bunkerville? Did you know the National Park Service has snipers? No. SWAT team? Next time you go to Capitol Reef, or uh, head down to Yellowstone or uh, Yosemite. Be careful. <laughs> they got snipers now. They got SWAT teams. This is the military-like buildup in response to the false narrative in Burns, Oregon. This was the boat ramp. Remember the boat ramp and the shooting at the boat ramp where they, they found thousands of rounds of ammo? Remember that? And they brought the thousands of rounds of ammo. And it turns out that the person who actually encouraged them to all go down there and shoot those thousands of rounds of ammo was John Kilman, the government informant. <laughs> Fabio Menaggio, that's right. And he testified on the stand about that. And if you ever actually watched the video, you would see that... <laughs> The only people in danger right here were these guys shooting their own feet. <laughs> I'm just kidding. If you were one of those guys, you did a really good job. Um, so, all right. And then, of course, you all know. Of course. Um, there, the, it, I, I love this. Off the charts, unbelievable. That's true to anybody who didn't have one single clue about what was going on. Right. But if you understood the evidence, if you understood what had happened in Nevada, this is not so unbelievable anymore. And um, it's the acquittal of Oregon refuge occupiers, which will of course embolden who? <laughs> Extremists and militias. I, I'm sorry, I've got to look at that again. Where, who are the extremists? There, oh, there he is. There's the extremists. I'm, seriously, how, mu how much brainwashing has happened in your life to not be able to see the guy with the gun who's going to kill somebody? How much do you have to worship government to see past Who's got the gun that's going to kill? I would ask those who don't understand your own religion to start to reconsider, again, what religion is. If you can't see who the danger is here, you might be a religious <laughs> Um, January 30th, 2017. Sorry, what? BLM officials come under fire. January 30th, Congress receives the investigative report of ethical violations and misconduct by Bureau of Land Management officials. February 2017, there's a letter from the Congressional Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. 
uh, relative to this uh, report wherein they find there has been intentional withholding of documents responsive to a congressional inquiry, attempts to conceal documents and destroy federal records, deleted, they deleted hundreds of documents, and at the heart of this is a guy named Dan Love, who allegedly attempted to influence the outcome of his own investigation by coaching a witness. By September of 2017, the same uh, special agent who was in charge of Operation Cerberus and the Bunkerville uh, Gold Butte standoff is uh, no longer with the BLM as a result of allegations and uh, founded allegations of corruption. Uh, subsequently, the Bundys then go on trial in 2017 for the Bunkerville standoff. Now, one of the poignant moments of the Nevada trials is when <coughs> Judge Navarro brings Ryan Bundy in. And as you know, Ryan Bundy was not satisfied with his counsel, and he wanted to represent himself. And when you do that, you have to hold what's called a Feretta canvas. It's where the judge interviews or questions the defendant to make sure they understand what could happen if you're actually crazy. So the judge wants to make sure you're not crazy, and therefore going to send yourself to jail by being a dummy. And that's, she brings Ryan Bundy in, she starts to question him, and she goes through every single charge. And by the time she's done, guess how long Ryan Bundy is facing in jail if he is found guilty? Anybody know? 360 years. Three life sentences plus 60. She allows Ryan to go on representing himself. He gives a wonderful opening in that trial. And uh, thank goodness for um, Carol Bundy and uh, Dan Hill, who was co-counsel with me in Nevada. Dan Hill realizes one day that the government was shredding documents relative to their the setup that didn't exist. <laughs> the operations center that didn't exist in Nevada. And they're shredding documents. And Dan says, man, I wonder if they hired somebody to do that for them. He starts calling around. And it turns out there's like 18 bags of shredded documents that they still have. And he puts into the possession of Carol Bundy. And Carol Bundy will not let these things go. She won't let anybody touch them. And so we get to begin uh, to argue that there has been a suppression of evidence. And... What we then discovered was unbelievable. Because think about this for a second. We have already gone to trial in Oregon. Okay? Wouldn't it have been nice in Oregon to have all the information from Nevada? Yeah. We did not. We were not allowed to have it. We were not allowed to introduce any of it in that trial in Oregon. And that became, but we won anyway. <coughs> And you cannot understand how miraculous that is until you understand what they were suppressing and keeping from us, which led to the way they were treated in Burns, Oregon. It's all related. So we begin to challenge uh, allegations like Ryan Bundy says that prior to the standoff, there were cameras placed around their house, and they were put under 24-hour surveillance. Okay, and the, uh, the government denied this. They said Ryan was lying. Uh, this is an example of some of those shredded documents. Uh, this is another, remember how they said they were, they, the Bundys lied about Davey. They used deceitful information to say that he had been deprived of his First Amendment rights. Remember how the Bundys, if you ever read the, uh, their um, motion practice, they said that the uh, there were snipers uh, around. They were put under 24-hour surveillance. There were cameras, and there were snipers around their house. These two men are probably just out hunting. Right? <laughs> They're not snipers. According to the government, they were, I'm not kidding, they were not snipers, and the Bundys were lying. There, were, there was no killing of cows, right? There was no, uh, where was PETA? During this, PETA is okay with killing. I thought they were against killing animals. Anyway, this is what Dan Love and his operatives were doing. 
They were killing cows and burying them in graves. Um, I, I'm gonna, I gotta go through this real quick because we're out of time. But basically what had happened is the FBI had denied their presence the entire time. And what it, if, if any of you recognize this, right over here, uh, this is the, um, let's see, um, I want to make sure I get this right. This is actually uh, I-15. Uh, no, sorry, I-15 would be out there. This is the road into Bunkerville. This is the turnoff out to the Bundy home. Okay? Right here, if you look right up here, there's like a little parking lot. And 1.6 miles from that parking lot is the Bundy home. This is where the FBI set up their forward operating base that did not exist. The Bundys were saying it did. The government was denying it. In fact, the government had not turned over any of the FBI files in the Nevada case, uh, both uh, either for Oregon or Nevada. And it turns out that the FBI actually had a forward operating base. It turns out that, remember that dog that Ammon Bundy kicked? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that started to attack him? Mm -hmm. See that guy right there? They were holding protest signs. And they were mocking the behavior of protesters le before, before the Gold Mute standoff. They were training the dog to attack protesters. And all of this was kept from us. Okay? So when Ammon Bundy and others <coughs> come out protesting in these First Amendment zones, guess what the dog's been trained to do by the government to attack them? <clears throat> there, there, there we have it, right? This, you remember this scene? Remember when Ammon pulls up? Ammon wants to see what's in the back of the white truck because what did they have in order to do? No, nope. gather cattle only. But the BLM and the government had engaged in the destruction of property without court order. There was no order for the impoundment of property, the destruction of property, anything other than the impoundment of cattle, and they were destroying property without a court order. And when Ammon came to discover that, they sicked the dog on him. Again, who, uh, who's got the guns here? Who's the, who are the extremists? Where is the militia? Uh, who was the special agent in charge? The guy that got fired for corruption. Um, the pretext for the government investigation and prosecution was built upon the Nevada Gold Butte impoundment. When Ammon Bundy showed up in Oregon in 2015, 2016, the sheriff pulled up information from law enforcement databases that reflected this suppression and corruption. They had targeted Ammon, labeled him a do domestic terrorist, and suppressed all of that information from us before we were ever able to go to trial in Oregon. We only began to get at it when we got to Nevada. Fortunately, the judge dismisses the charges against Cliven, his two sons, in Nevada, and dismisses them with prejudice. Uh, later, uh, as a result of all of this information we discover on behalf of Jeanette, we filed a wrongful death case in Oregon, where for the first time, we're able to begin to express the conspiracy that begins in Nevada, and the suppression that begins in Nevada, that culminates in the death of Lavoie and the prosecution of these men and their imprisonment for years. And for the first time, we're able to really start to talk about that, not publicly, I can't talk about the case publicly, but I can show you information which is already available for public dissemination, which is the wrongful death claim. And again, you have to understand that when you are, when we're going to trial in Oregon, we have been lied to by the government. They have said that the Bundys lied about snipers. We have evidence now that has come out in the Nevada trial, which is still under seal, which shows that, in fact, they did have snipers posted around the Bundy home. They were surveilling the Bundy home. There were threat assessments prepared by the FBI 
that said the Bundys were not a threat. Think about that. The Bundys were not a threat. And in fact, the threat assessment laid out the things that the government should not do. And guess what Dan Love did? Everything he was told not to do. In fact, he created a false threat assessment of his own to justify his actions. None of that was ever given to us in Oregon. But for some reason, all we can talk about is these crazy militia guys in Oregon. Instead of focusing on what's really going on here, which is systemic government corruption over multi-years that involves the FBI, the BLM, and the prosecutor's offices all engaged in a criminal conspiracy. Why is that not the story? When the evidence is plainly before the press, it is there. It is undeniable, and yet you're not hearing that. You even got the Wooten letter. You've seen the Wooten letter. A whistleblower from within the BLM who cites it as the greatest instance of corruption in the history of the Department of the Interior. Have you guys read the Wooten letter yet? Again, it's publicly available. There's a second Wooten letter, which they will not let out of the prosecutor's office in the state of Nevada. If we want to see it, we have to go get special permission to go in and read it. We can't take a copy, nothing. But Wooten has penned a second letter. Now, um, in the wrongful death suit, we claim Lavoy Finnicum was deliberately executed by a pre-planned government ambush after he had exited his vehicle with his hands up along an isolated section of U.S. Route 395 in Hardy County. Now, for those of you who know anything about that crime scene, maybe attended the Astorita trial, Jeanette was not kidding. There was a sworn testimony from a law enforcement officer that one of the officers radioed down to the others at the dead man stop. Have any of you driven that road in winter? That is not a safe place to pull over. When you come down that hill at about 65 miles per hour, you cannot even see the dead man stop. And in the Astorita trial, they admitted under sworn testimony that they were not satisfied with where that stop was put. It was not safe. Even the FBI guys testified that, the, remember the guy who jumps out, the boy's so reckless, he's almost hitting this FBI guy? They questioned why in the world he jumped in front of the car. Yeah. Nobody was out there saying, man, I can't believe he tried to swerve and kill some FBI guy. The FBI guys were saying, I can't believe he jumped out there. It was crazy. We were worried about him because he jumped the opposite way we all said to go. Lavoy comes around that corner. They are shot at, according to testimony again, before they ever even have a chance to break. Lavoy swerves off, gets out of his car, is shot to death at a dead man's kill stop. Highly dangerous stop. Again, testimony. These are not normal stops. They are not safe stops. They're not de-escalating stops. You don't shoot at Ryan Payne when he puts his hands out to de-escalate a situation. An officer calls down while he's driving and says, we're going to have to kill this guy. Why? At what point in time can any person with a rational mind say, that the government is justified in killing Lavoie Finnicum when every single escalation in the evidence, I don't care if you have a bias against who Lavoie Finnicum is, but every single testimony, every single piece of evidence shows the government has escalated, conspired, and lied. But for some reason, Lavoie Finnicum is the one who we think deserved to die. You have to be a absolutely mentally depraved religious zealot to believe that the God which is your government can kill a person under those circumstances and still be justified in writing some report that says that's okay. You are not thinking clearly. You have not done your homework. You have not looked at the evidence. Go look at it. <laughs> the testimony is all there. And then to say he had a gun planted in his jacket after you leave him laying there for nine hours in the cold, in the dark, without securing the scene, doing nothing to help preserve evidence 
until somebody gets there nine hours later. All that time, there's no report of a gun in his jacket. None. Uh, but what we do see is we do see people scrubbing the scene, removing items. And we have allegations from the United States government about agents who are not being honest and truthful, who are suppressing information and evidence, who are hiding information and evidence. Now, that's why uh, I, I wish I could go into more detail, but this is why the wrongful death suit was needed. Uh, we have alleged that the defendants, individually and together, were engaged in a pattern and practice of deliberate conduct, including willful and illegal conduct, which conduct was the cause, in fact, the proximate cause and or legal cause of the illegal shooting and death of Lavoy Finnicum. Now, um, it all starts back. Now, if you think that's too much, you ought to hear the language the judge used in Nevada. The court found in Nevada that the prosecution's statements that they were unaware of discovery was grossly shocking. That the prosecution denied the defense their ability to proffer by withholding evidence. Dismissal was appropriate when investigative or prosecutorial conduct has violated the Constitution or statutory rights and no other remedy is available to police ethical misconduct by prosecutors under these supervisory powers requires um, that uh, requires flagrant misbehavior and substantial prejudice and the government's conduct cannot be accidental the judge found all of those and found the case worthy of dismissal with prejudice but for some reason we've got voices out there who still seem to think Lavoy was in the wrong. How in the world can you come to that realization when the evidence all says otherwise? I get that people may not like Lavoy's religious beliefs, that people may not like Lavoy's political beliefs, but there is no justification yet. Perhaps there is some. Two not guilty verdicts, suppression by government, lying by the government. You ought to read the Wooten letter in addition. I have that, but I'm, I'm over time. You bet. investigation of the Bundy starting in 2014. He says, as the case agent and lead investigator for the Department of Interior BLM, I found myself in an unusual situation. I was specifically asked to lead a comprehensive, professional, thorough, unbiased, and independent investigation into the largest and most expansive and important investigation ever within the Department of the Interior. The longer the investigation went on, the more extremely unprofessional, familiar, racy, vulgar, and bias-filled actions, open comments, and inappropriate electronic communications I was made aware of, or I personally witnessed. At any given time, you could hear subjects of this investigation openly referred to as retards, rednecks, overweight women with big jowls, douchebags, tractor face idiots, inbreds, etc. I became aware of potentially captured comments in which our own law enforcement officers allegedly bragged about roughing up Dave Bundy, grinding his face in the ground, and Dave Bundy having little bits of gravel stuck in his face. My supervisor even instigated 
the unprofessional monitoring of jail calls between defendants and their wives. I had my own supervisor tell me that former BLM Special Agent Dan Love is the BLM OLES director's boy, and they indicated they were going to hide and protect him. BLM SAC Love was a liability to our agency and the Clive and Bundy case. I was even told of threats of physical harm that this former SAC made to his subordinate employee and his family. Um, there is more language, I'll stay away from that. Additionally, it should be noted there was a religious test of sorts in order to work on the case. The investigation indicated that on multiple occasions, former special agent in charge, uh, Love specifically and purposely ignored USAO, which is the U.S. Attorney Office, and BLM Civilian Management Direction in order to command the most intrusive, oppressive, large-scale, and militaristic trespass cattle impound possible. Now, this is Special Agent Love, who's conducting the Gold Butte standoff operation, the impoundment operation. His friend, who he has worked with on multiple occasions in the state of Utah on similarly unprofessional investigations that led to the deaths of three people, his friend is now the special agent in charge of the FBI in Oregon. Over the Malheur occupation, Greg Bretzing. How in the world does that conflict of interest, that unprofessionalism, be allowed to reign and govern over the operations of American institutions of government? But that's who received the first information about Ammon Bundy and started and took charge in Malheur was Greg Bretzing for the FBI. And his friend was Dan Love, who gets fired. Tell me how, with all that we've discovered in these cases around now prosecutorial misconduct, that that is ever okay. And that somehow a message of militant people occupying a, ref a refuge is the narrative. Why is the narrative not the extreme government corruption? with ourselves, it's because we're that divided as a nation. We're that unable to talk to each other. That we will use now the government to harm each other for our own political purposes, and that's a sad day. Um, I'd ask everyone who comes across this case to revisit it, to look from the very beginning at the lies, the deception, and the criminal conspiracy that begins on the part of the United States government in Nevada, using a, a little family. Uh, in Bunkerville to accomplish some pretty shady purposes. Um, I know for sure that not only does Jeanette need your help, but uh, our country needs your help. And uh, I appreciate the time and your consideration of these issues, and thank you for letting me be here.